hello, and uh, welcome to the, uh, the 20th anniversary Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. Uh, we've got uh, an exciting uh, program on the Potomac today, um, and obviously there's a, there's a great crowd here, so thanks to all of you for coming, and uh, I just want to remind you that the, the festival keeps, uh, keeps running until uh, Sunday, through Sunday, so there are many more films that, that you can catch um, in the coming days and, and on the weekend. Um, and uh, uh, we're very happy to have with us today uh, the filmmakers Alexandra Cousteau and uh, Bob Cole, uh, both of whom uh, will be uh, uh, doing question and answer sessions after their uh, films. And uh, also very, uh, very fortunate to have with us the Potomac Riverkeeper, Ed Merrifield, and Ed, Ed is going to introduce the program. So could you please uh, join me in, in welcoming Ed Merrifield. Thank you, Peter. We can all thank Peter and all the folks at the Environmental Film Festival for having an all Potomac evening, which is what this is. My name is Ed Merrifield, and I am your Potomac River Keeper. Our mission is to stop pollution. Yay, thank you. <laughs> Somebody has to be your Potomac River Keeper. Our mission is to stop pollution and restore clean water, and we take our mission very seriously. As far as we're concerned, all man-made pollution going into our rivers and streams is wrong. The illegal pollution needs to be stopped immediately, but it's all wrong. And why? In 2000, excuse me, in 1970, the early 1970s, when it was clear that our states weren't going to do anything about the, our rivers catching on fire, about the blue-green color and slime across our streams and rivers, about our fisheries disappearing, and about our president saying that the river that was going by his window was a national disgrace. When that was all very clear, the federal government stepped up and created one of the great laws that this country has ever had, and that's the Clean Water Act. In the Clean Water Act, there's a goal, and the goal is very ambitious. And it said that we will be putting no more, no more of our man-made pollution into the waters of this nation by 1985. So my job is to get us to 1985. That really is how I look at my job. Uh, how we do it and what we do, well, I will just summarize that very quickly. It's something I've been able to say for many years. And that is that there is no organization whose actions remove more of the major pollutants from the Potomac than our organization, and we have the numbers to back that up. If you'd like, all right. If you'd like more information on our organization, please grab one of the newsletters on the way out. Something else I would like you to take home with you, and that is something you can tell those folks, your friends and family, that aren't here and really don't pay any attention to our rivers and streams. Maybe we can get their attention with this. We learned in high school that we are two-thirds water. Babies are about 80% water, which is a greater percentage of water, by the way, than most fish. But we learned in high school that we're two-thirds water. If you live in this area and drink the water, whether it comes out of the tap, out of the major bottlers, a soda, tea, coffee, even beer, even that Rocky Mountain beer is bottled in the Potomac watershed. Surprise. If you live in this area and you eat the food and you drink the water, you are not only mostly water, you are mostly Potomac River. You are more Potomac River than you are anything else. Fact. Another fact. Uh, the USGS, US Geological Survey, has done some reports and has done some testing and has found out that of these new emerging contaminants that are in our waters, the kind that are that micro amounts affect living systems. Two thirds of these contaminants, two thirds of them that are in our waters, go through our water suppliers who do a great job of meeting all the EPA requirements. But two thirds of these new emerging contaminants that they don't have to test for normally go right through our water suppliers and into our tap and into us. We have two VIPs, very important producers. Uh, each of them, by the way, will have uh, a quick Q&A afterwards. Q &A afterwards. So, I'm asking you, please have a question. Don't have a long comment. You know that happens sometimes. We, no, you don't have a lot of time, so please, if you have a question, make it a question. I'd appreciate that. All right. Alexandra Cousteau has been following in the footsteps of her, of her grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, 
since she was very young, exploring the waters of this world, educating us through storytelling. Since in 2008, she created a nonprofit right, based right here in DC called Blue Legacy. Uh, this nonprofit, excuse me here, I want to get as much into this in as I can, is all about uh, leveraging new and emerging technologies to connect mainstream audiences with their local watersheds and their water planet. Her global initiatives seek to inspire and empower individuals to protect not only the ocean and its inhabitants, but also the human communities that rely on the purity of freshwater resources. Now she has lots of honors, I'm not going to read them all, but just so you get a feel for it. National Geographic, United Nations, uh, University of California, South Carolina's Aquariums, the Arava Institute, and even Vanity Fair. <laughs> Alexandra is a resident. She lives in the Potomac watershed. She is a friend of Potomac Riverkeeper and all water keepers everywhere. Please help me welcome Alexandra Cousteau. <laughs> Good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I'm incredibly grateful to the Environmental Film Festival for including me in their roster of filmmakers. Because to be honest with you, I never really felt like I was a filmmaker. And that might seem odd, considering that I've produced almost 70 or 80 short films over the course of the past few years. And I've produced them, directed them, voiced over. I've been in them, I've overseen the editing, I've been part of all aspects of making them happen, but uh, I don't make films as an end in themselves, and I think that's what it is. Um, I make films because I want to shape conversations about issues that I think we are all part of, that we all need to be involved in, that we all need to understand. That's really why I do what I do. I was born into a filmmaking family, but they weren't filmmakers necessarily. They were advocates. They dreamed of a world where people understood and cared for our oceans, conserved them, understood how they were connected to them. And they explored and discovered our oceans in ways that no one ever had before and brought them into our living rooms. And those films shaped conversation they inspired people to be part of the solution, to help protect them. And uh, that's important. My grandfather made, it, made sure that water was a part of my life always. He taught me to dive when I was seven years old. I've been swimming since I was four months old. I have been blessed um, with the opportunity to travel the world and, and have water places be part of my childhood, have memories that I cherish, um, be part of shaping how I see the world. And when I think about the urgency of this issue, of understanding that our water planet is interconnected, that we live within watersheds, water systems, that we rely on uh, for our health, for our well-being, for the prosperity of our communities, and those water systems are being fragmented and it's degrading the quality of our water and the quantity of water that we have available to us. Many of the places that I went to as a child that shaped who I've become are gone today. Those are places that I won't be able to take my seven-month-old daughter. Um, those are places that won't shape her vision of the world. And I know all of you in this room probably have a water place that is precious to you a place where you caught frogs as a child, or swung on a rope swing, or um, visited with friends and, and made memories. And I'm sure those places are precious to you. Some of them probably still exist, others maybe not. But we all need to care for the water in our own backyards. And we all need to be part of shaping the conversation about water. So that brings me to Blue Legacy, um, an organization I started in 2008 to tell the story of our water planet. And I didn't want to make long feature films. I wanted to take people along for the ride, 
In 2009, I spent 100 days traveling around the world to six different continents looking at different water issues. And in 2010, I decided I would do the same thing in North America because when I came back from my international expedition, people said that was incredible. Obviously, we have a global water crisis. There's big problems out there. It's a good thing that doesn't happen here in America. So um, we traveled 18,800 18, miles across North America. We covered stories in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. I had a crew of 12 people, and when I was trying to figure out how I was going to travel all these people with our hundreds of pounds of gear and um, all of their personal items, I realized we couldn't fly, we couldn't drive in cars. So we found a bus, and the bus that we found was um, actually John McCain's former Straight Talk Express. <laughs> we recycled it, and um, it traveled us uh, around North America very well. We used it as our workstation and editing suite, and um, have a lot of memories in that bus. But mostly, it was where we cut our films where we talked about our stories, where we decided where we would go next, where we cleaned our gear, and where we edited these, these films. And we told these stories every single day as we got to a new place and met new people and learned new things and saw new places. We posted blogs and photos and short films with the hopes that people would take those stories and share them with their friends through conversation around a dinner table, um, through Twitter and Facebook, that they would email them um, links to the films from Vimeo and YouTube, that they would start talking about issues that we may be talking about in the Colorado, where the Colorado River no longer reaches the sea, or about the dead zone that is at the mouth of the Mississippi River, or the coal ash spill in the Emory River in Tennessee, or any of the other issues we looked at. But those issues aren't just happening there. They're happening in backyards across America. And um, this film, this is the first time anyone's seen it outside of our team. And it was our last film. It was uh, the film from the Potomac because as we came back to Washington, D.C., where 40 years ago we signed the Clean Water Act, which was landmark legislation and which we need to protect uh, we realized we wanted to take all of the stories that we'd seen, all of the people that we'd met, everything that we'd learned, and wrap it up in one final message, which was the message of a watershed, the threats to a watershed and what we can do. And so this 10-minute film um, features some people who are heroes of mine, including Ed. Um, I love river keepers. I've met them all over this nation and they are a special breed of person and you are no different, Ed. They are heroes in every sense of the word and I hope that one of your takeaways tonight after you see these films and learn a little bit about the issues in the Potomac River Shed is to sign up for the Potomac River Keepers newsletter and help them do what they do because they are protecting our watershed here, the water that is in our backyard and in every one of us, as Ed said. So please do give them your support. But I want to leave time after the short film for questions, so I'm going to suggest that we roll tape and we can pick it up afterwards. Thank you.